humiliating on said screen. <laughs> so there you go, Mary, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Tara. And thank you also, Dirk. Um, I must admit before I start that if any of you think that this lecture has been clumsily cobbled together from a variety of sources, then you're quite right. Um, it was because it'd been done very hurriedly. So in the circumstances, I must ask for your indulgence. I'd better set the scene with a few words about the Valmika Ramayana for those of you who don't know it. Firstly, it's not by Valmiki, but the name's so entrenched by now that we're stuck with it. It was first composed in Sanskrit in about the fifth century BC as a heroic romance telling about Rama, a human prince, both mighty and high principled, who accepts undeserved exile to the forest in order to preserve his father's integrity. His wife, Sita, and one of his younger brothers, Lakshmana, insist on accompanying him. Sita is abducted by a lustful non-human monster called Ravana, often, but by no means exclusively, said to have 10 heads and 20 arms, hence the illustration. Over the subsequent two and a half millennia, that's up to today, the narrative has survived and flourished under an enormous number of adaptations in all media, verbal, visual and performance, in all languages of South and Southeast Asia and elsewhere, in many differing religions and polemical causes, sadly, some of them now irreconcilable with the values of the tale's hero but all testify to the immediate and enduring popularity of this simple tale. The tale was conceived, performed and transmitted orally for at least 500 years, so that by the time when written versions are thought to have appeared alongside the continuing oral tradition, it was no longer possible to talk of the Ramayana, only of a Ramayana or Ramayanas. The critical edition text has clearly been compiled from the work of many different tellers over most of a millennium, with material in its apparatus from a further millennium. And you can see seven big volume, red volumes behind me. And that is uh, the critical edition. Even more clearly, the text reflects the changing nature, nature of the society that generated them. By the end of the first thousand years or so of the tale's existence, the virtuous warrior prince was being presented as the god Vishnu in person. But no matter what additions were incorporated, the main lines of the narrative had to be and were retained. Ravana could never be allowed to triumph. The human must always win. This requirement had by this time been made much more explicit. A boon earned from another god protected the arrogant Ravana from defeat by any creature except a human. Reconciling these two self-evidently irreconcilable concepts was attempted by presenting Rama as an incarnation of Vishnu, Vishnu coming to earth in human form for the specific purpose of destroying Ravana. Uh, 
incorporating this drastic innovation into the existent narrative was not without problems, inconsistencies, and modification to the traditional views of the characters, as I hope to demonstrate by examining in some detail a passage evidently composed during a period of flux, with the process of evolution from the heroic towards full acceptance of Vishnu, a supreme god, uh, with his epic um, purpose still incomplete. One of the problems I shall constantly run up against in this lecture is what tends to use when I'm talking about material in book seven, which is later material in terms of composition, about events that happen chronologically long before those of the core text, books two to six in the handout. But they are dependent in the minds of new authors and audiences alike on incidents that are still to happen in the core text. Have they already happened or not? I'll try to be clear. The earlier form of the narrative presented in the five core books, books two to six, seems to have been closed by the return of the victorious, still human Rama to his capital to be consecrated as its king in a standard happy ending. A supplementary book, now called Book 7, was later added to describe Rama's activities as he takes up his role as ideal king up to the end of his life. Only in a very few passages in this book, and even fewer in the corresponding supplementary book one, which deals with the hero's birth and childhood, does Vishnu appear. Awkwardly placed at the beginning of book seven is a long passage narrated by Agastya, a sage who visits the court to congratulate the new king on his victory, filling out details of the birth and career of the villain Ravana. Now remember, Ravana's already dead by this time. As a new set of cultural values was emerging from the heroic ethos, represented throughout almost all of the core books, two to six. Agastya's narrative involves the human Rama in the process of being transformed into the god Vishnu. The successive concepts don't always sit easily together. That's not the only problem posed by Agastya's narrative. Almost certainly, it itself was almost, was almost certainly composed in three or more stages, each with its own values, all amalgamated rather clumsily over a long time span. The material was compiled into two subunits, with subunit two enclosing subunit one in a fashion common with continuations. And the boundaries at beginning and ending aren't at all clear. As a whole, the passage is presented as a glorification of the victorious Rama, explaining and evaluating the might and nature of the defeated demons by detailing their exploits, necessarily committed before, sometimes several generations before, the well-known, well-loved events narrated in the core text, where they are all killed. Events that could not be altered 
without incurring the scorn and even hostility of the new audiences, now that their hero was becoming known as Vishnu. Nevertheless, the earlier narrative was both extended and consolidated with a new focus, a new context, and a new purpose, the preservation of the entire cosmos. Subunit 1 examines how far Ravana conforms to the traditional warrior values prevalent in the Rama story from its inception, enlarging on a number of illusions and resolving some anomalies now perceived in the text of the core books, presenting a progressive deterioration in his behavior as a brother, as a sexual being, and as a warrior. It opens, naturally enough, with the birth of Ravana and his siblings. Now, until this point, Ravana had been known only as the grandson, or then the son, of two humanoid, virtuous sages. With allusions to his ancestry in the whole of the core books, plus book one, raising pertinent but never stated questions about his demonic nature and appearance. Where did he get his 10 heads and 20 arms from? An answer tracing his origin via the female line from a demon, Sumalin, is provided. Allusions to how he earned his boon of limited invincibility had been made throughout the core text, but are only now explained in any detail. Ravana then begins his career responsibly by focusing on his family duties. But reliance on his boon soon leads him to ignore his duty of unquestioning respect for his virtuous elder half-brother. And that, in the Indian context, is a terrible thing to do. And he, he's re reprimanded by his brother for his riotous behavior. Ravana offends protocol and breaches the theme of statecraft and its obligations, which are already prevalent in much of Book 7 before Agastya's narrative was inserted, when he kills the unfortunate messenger, attacks his brother in person in his realm, and seizes his flying palace, giving narrative substance to the frequent vague allusions to some such episode throughout books three to six. Ravana now develops an unthinking addiction to conquest, carelessly bereaving his sister of her husband, a failure in his duty of protection used by the author to explain what by then was seen to be an anomaly in the earlier narrative, the fact that she was then roaming the forest under no male supervision. Characterized as ever by a vehement lack of respect for her brother, she complains that he has made her a widow. So he sends her far off under the protection of another brother and an army of 14,000 demons ready to play their part in the pivotal episode of the core text in book three. The crucial issue of Ravana's sexual conduct is now challenged. He indulges in a series of attacks on women all over the universe, all threaten him ineffectually with future revenge. But more significantly, one of them, thwarted by his violation in her desire to marry Vishnu, 
vows to be reborn as Sitar for his destruction. Significantly, the episode gives no indication of yet recognizing Rama as an incarnation of Vishnu. Finally, Ravana catches sight of a nymph, rapes her despite her pleading, perhaps unwisely, that she's related to him via his hated half-brother and incurs a curse from her husband, resentful son of that defeated half-brother, that his head will burst into seven pieces if he rapes another woman. Only after this terrifying curse does Ravana take the matter of his behaviour seriously and is said to lose any further desire to rape an unwilling woman. The audience, both fictive, that's Rama, etc., and real, um, can now be reassured that Sita remained unharmed during her long captivity. Whether this curse breaches the tombs of the boon of invulnerability is not raised. Evidently, it was more important to affirm Sita's chastity. Doubts about Ravana's physical prowess, as well as his sexuality, increase throughout Agastya's narrative. Gods are inhibited from resisting his attacks only by their duty to uphold the boon, not by any lack of strength. The audience already knew that men were excluded from Ravana's boon, but a contemptuous insult to the god Shiva's gatekeeper incurs a curse that now explains the prominent role of monkeys in his eventual defeat. Earthly kings are defeated until the dying king of Iodia predicts that a future king in that line, his descendant Rama, will avenge his death. This prophecy is, of course, anomalous as you all recognize, Rama's ancestor is human and so is not prevented by the boon from killing Ravana himself. But this issue is necessarily not explored. The anomaly is unlikely to indicate that the episode predates acceptance into the narrative of the all too prevalent boon motif it's just another simple error forced on an unwary but enthusiastic author by his knowledge of the preordained outcome. There's a limit to the amount of meticulous logic we should expect the continuator of such a complex narrative to exercise. Ravana continues on his series of outrageously arrogant attacks on the worlds of men and gods, for which the gods are helpless to inflict punishment, prevented as they are by the boon of inviolability, and by the fact that the audience already know how the story is to end, or, as far as they're concerned, how it's already ended. Agastya's narration exploits their knowledge and a sense of doom pervades his recitation. Doom, but only for Ravana. The still human Rama, or Vishnu, will eventually kill him. But his wife's chastity is already a matter of concern. Throughout the later Rama tradition, there's an increasing insistence that she be kept free from the most remote possibility of conferring pollution on her husband. 
now that his earlier role as the ideal hero is being developed into that of the ideal king. Uh, it doesn't matter about Sita herself much. Fully in tune with the issues addressed further on in Book 7, this triumphant and reassuring climax of subunit 1 would have provided a finely crafted conclusion to Agastya's narrative until obscured by the incorporation of subunit 2. For Rama, the climax of subunit 1 is the triumphant guarantee of his wife's continued purity with which it is closed. As for Sita, her image as a faithful wife, heroically resisting the threats and blandishments of her captor, have been wrecked. She's now a passive victim, no longer directing the plot. <sighs> Subunit 2. This happy note of triumph, so well fitted to its context as part of the celebrations of the king's long postponed consecration, was not allowed to remain unchallenged when Subunit 2 was created. These enclosing passages move the context on to a later stage in the developing culture by fully embracing the concept of Rama as an incarnation of Vishnu and its consequences. Accordingly, Vishnu in person plays a substantial role in this subunit, which shows clear signs, narrative as well as cultural, of having been incorporated at a much later stage in the process of transition than the majority of the book seven narrative. An apparently original tale involving the defeat of some of Ravana's ancestors, the sons of Sukesha, is introduced into the overall narrative. The author makes apt use of already existent material. In fact, this addition to the plot provides an example of internal development arising from a casual mention in a brief passage in subunit one. One of the demons involved necessarily survives Vishnu's onslaught because he had been already active in book six, giving the passage a spurious air of authenticity. Another demon, having no backstory in the core text, cannot therefore be allowed to survive Agastya's narrative, and he loses his life heroically after a savage battle in Ravana's later successful attack on Indra, warrior king of the gods. The other most prominent demon ancestors are not mentioned outside this carefully crafted passage, which seems to be unknown elsewhere in the text of the Valmiki Ramayana. The absence of any telltale allusions elsewhere in the critical edition together with the repeated references to Vishnu, locates this passage towards the end of the tradition. It is in general more ornate in style and language than other parts of Agastya's narrative, showing linguistic features indicative of a later date. In his coda to the incident, Agastya pointedly disparages Ravana compared to his defeated ancestors, but avoids the unstated corollary that he's thereby disparaging Ravana's conqueror by firmly equating that conqueror, Vishnu, with Rama, 
The passage represents a major development reflecting the culmination of the gradual transition of the Valmiki Ramayana as a whole from heroic romance to epic rescue of the cosmos. The salient points of the whole Valmiki Ramayana subsequent to the introduction of the concept of Rama as an avatar of Vishnu are reworked. Vishnu's task is now primarily to save, not Sita, but the cosmos, particularly the gods, from Ravana's depredations. And the objectives of the original Rama story, to preserve his father's integrity and to rescue Sita, become increasingly marginalised. The original tale of a human hero rescuing his human wife from a monster has been superseded. And Sita, whether herself or some analogue from the earlier generation, is not even mentioned. The passage is nonetheless rooted in the earlier text. To the extent that the appeal to Vishnu to counter the threat to the cosmos from demons who profit from a divine boon, to be continued by a much reduced copy of the war to be conducted in Book 6, is closely modelled on a similar, very late passage intruding into the account of the birth of Rama and his brothers in Book 1. And that passage also mentions an assault on Indra by Ravana. The presentation of Vishnu in a heroic narrative role in the Sukesha episode is in itself a mark of lateness in the tradition. While simple mentions of Vishnu should not necessarily be considered as identifications of Rama with Vishnu, narrative appearances are still rare and therefore significant. Allusions have been noted in the core text to other parts of Agastya's narrative, but the absence of any specifically related to Vishnu's defeat of Sukesha's sons helps to confirm the very late date of that part of subunit two. The corollary of the incarnation concept is explored shortly afterwards. The climax of subunit two is the successful attack on Indra's heaven by a later generation of demons led by Ravana and his son Indrajit. Yes, um, the names get confusing here. I'll explain later. Alarmed at the prospect, Indra, the god, appeals to Vishnu to, ex to join in the god's resistance. But clearly rather embarrassed, Vishnu has to refuse and sit idly by on the grounds that the time is not yet right for him to kill Ravana. But he does promise to intervene later i.e. when he's become incarnate as the human Rama. Eventually, Indra himself takes the field, only to be ignominiously defeated by Indrajit, Ravana's son, who has imperiously taken over command from his exhausted father in an abrupt intervention that's uncharacteristic both of son and of father. In the battles to come in books five and six, but already remembered by the audience, Indrajit, though a powerful warrior, is respectfully subservient to his father. The whole implausible episode appears to be a clumsy, and specious attempt to explain the name Indrajit. Indra Defeater 
i.e. he who would be capable of defeating Indra, by relating it to an actual incident. However, Indra is defeated, bound, and taken to the demon's island stronghold, where the more specific meaning, defeater of Indra, is subsequently conferred as a reward by the smooth-tongued Brahma when he negotiates the ransom of the captive in exchange for the boon that Indrajit will be killed in battle only if he fails to complete a particular sacrifice. And this will be immediately recognized by the audience as a reference to Indrajit's eventual death in Book 6. As a tailpiece to this whole episode, the focus is then abruptly shifted from the demons to the gods. Brahma subjects the miserable Indra to a lecture, attributing his military impotence to punishment for the rape of a sage's wife, found in slightly different form in Book 1 of the Valmiki Ramana. He can be absolved of this sin by performing a sacrifice to Vishnu, but evidently Indra is as open to punishment for sexual misconduct as Ravana, although this punishment is rather more seemly, if less immediately effective, than the spectacular loss of his genitals meted out to him by the outraged sage in the account of the adultery in Book 1. Nonetheless, a consequence of this unexpected digression, presumably unintended, is that in diminishing Indra's might, it diminishes Indrajit's triumph, and therefore the glory of his ultimate conqueror, Lakshmana, Rama's brother. Agastya's account of the demons reaches its climax when Ravana himself suffers two humiliating personal defeats. Both accounts reciprocate and even parody the capture and release of Indra, and both come loaded with unstated menace for Ravana. The first victor, Arjuna Kartavirya, will be recognized by an audience well versed in the Mahabharata as doomed to be defeated by one who will then submit to Rama's might in Book 1 of the Valmiki Ramayana. The other, even more humiliating defeat is meted out by Varlin, mighty monkey king, to be killed by Rama in Book 4. Varlin picks up Ravana and flies around the borders of India with him dangling from his armpit. Much to the enjoyment of the audience, no doubt. It's very likely that the episode narrated with such gusto by Agastya was suggested by the dying Varlin's indignant vote boast that he could have captured Ravana easily and restored Sita to Rama himself. A notable difference between Agastya's narrative in Book 7 and the portrait of the demon family with which the audience of Books 3 to 6 have become familiar is the almost complete absence of any attempt at characterization. The Ravana who had burst onto the scene in the middle of Book 3 is bombastic, arrogant, self-confident, buoyed up by sycophantic courtiers and heedless of advice that contradicts his own self-image as 
omnipotent. Yet as Rama's attack on Lanka proceeds, he becomes ever more wary, at first hiding his misgivings behind a screen of rage, eventually being overcome by grief after the death of one close relative after another, and even admitting regret for one crucial incident and voicing his sorrow for the death of his mightiest brother in terms strikingly similar to those in which Rama laments his fear that his own brother Lakshmana might have been killed. Despite his ten heads and ability to fly, the monster of book six had been shown to develop an affectingly normal human personality, an appropriate foe for the still human Rama. Agastya's Ravana shows no such subtle development, no such gradually unfolding emotions, indeed no human feeling at all, even in the earlier subsection before Rama had been transformed into Vishnu. His sister alone is allowed to retain the outspoken contempt for her brother she shows in book three. And the audience might be tempted to think that Ravana consigns her to the forest for the sake of sheer self-protection. The real explanation, of course, is authorial necessity. Her encounter there with Rama is crucial leading to the abduction of Sita that sets off the war between Rama and Ravana. Agastya's Ravana throughout both subsections is governed by anger, pride, lust. The lust modified at last by a certain amount of self-interest and, again, authorial necessity this time the growing need to preserve Sita's chastity, even in the face of outright defeat by one more powerful foe and utter humiliation by Varlin, no, is, no emotion is attributed to him. The fearsome human monster of book six is now nothing more than a pantomime villain with no humanity and no monstrosity. Rather more surprisingly, Rava is not the only hero defeated by mockery. Indra and others of his fellow, fellow gods suffer the same banal degradation. When Ravana attacks an important sacrifice, the assembled gods are treated with similar derision. Inhibited by his boon of invincibility, they can't resist the onslaught. Terrified, they take ignominious refuge inside the wounds of various animals. The sacrificer cravenly uses his status to evade combat, abandoning the assembled ascetic seers to be devoured by Ravana. Later on, Vishnu, the supreme spirit, is clearly embarrassed at having to refuse Indra's request for aid to repulse the next attack by the demons and excuses himself by pointing out that the time for him to fulfill his destiny, preordained by the core narrative, has not yet arrived. Worse still, not only is Indra ultimately captured by Indrajit and taken prisoner to Lanka to be ransomed by Brahma's cajolery and bribery, but he's further humiliated by the lecture he receives on his own earlier sexual transgression. The warrior king of the gods 
is portrayed as nothing more than a naughty schoolboy scolded by his headmaster. But if Indra, hampered by his past sin, is such a poor figure that Indra Jit's victory over him is no great achievement, how great is Indra Jit's killer's triumph? How can subunit two fulfill Agastya's declared overall purpose of celebrating Rama and Lakshmana's defeat of such a weak opponent? And is Agastya's whole account of the demons any more successful in extolling Rama's might for having triumphed over an utterly fearsome enemy who yet has no power, and who is eventually presented as a figure of fun. Agastya's narrative, recited during the celebrations of the victorious Rama's consecration as king, specifically at Rama's request, and presumably before his own court and distinguished visitors, was presented as extolling Rama's glorious achievement. But did Rama really enjoy hearing that his glory was tarnished and his supreme exertions of body and spirit had been just not worth the bother? And how would Sita like being told and told in public that She'd never been in any real danger and that her heroic resistance and forlorn despair in captivity had been all unnecessary now that Ravana's lost his desire to rape her. Worse still, now that Rama has been elevated to divine status as Vishnu, he and his fellow gods fare little better. At the hands of the creators of Agastya's narrative of the demons, by comparison with successive creators of the core text and with the characters they created, how are the mighty fallen? So what is the purpose of Agastya's narrative? with its two subunits, and a third that I haven't time to deal with today, with all their anomalies and unintended consequences, it remains a development out of the core narrative found in Valmiki Ramana 1-6, to but not a departure from its main purpose, the exaltation of Rama. Logic tells us that Rama seems diminished, but he still wins. As a whole, it presents a succession of disparate episodes, clearly, carefully and effectively structured to demonstrate the limitations of Ravana's, Ravana's moral, physical and sexual prowess, founded as they are in his boon of invulnerability alone, it's been compiled from narrative elements of varied natures, military might, statecraft, familial obligations and respect, intervention by Vishnu, burlesque humiliation and ridicule of the villain, all overhung and welded together by a sense of doom based on the audience's foreknowledge of the outcome. It's not about Rama. It's about Ravana. The composition of this narrative or narratives can be shown by reference to linguistic and other complex criteria to span a considerable period. During this transitional stage, the old heroic culture, concentrating on human men and their and their superhuman exploits 
was being submerged by a culture that preferred stories of gods with supernatural boons replacing natural prowess and wonders occasionally giving way to tasteless ridicule and vulgar burlesque. The old order was changing. The earliest form of the Rama story that we can retrieve had narrated the efforts of the virtuous young prince to uphold the integrity of his father and to rescue his beloved captive wife and punish her abductor, Ravana. When the gods became involved as more than mere admirers of the human Rama, the purpose of the narrative was changed to a more universal one. Ravana was a threat to the whole cosmos, particularly to the gods themselves, and a hero must be found who would destroy Ravana and save the gods from destruction. The unintended consequence of boons conferred on the demon's king by Brahma himself, making the gods powerless to act in their own defence. Vishnu undertakes the task of becoming incarnate as the human Rama and narrative problems abound. Some, where heroes and villains alike are disparaged, have been discussed already. This change of purpose prompts a number of simplistic questions to which the answers, as you can guess, are far from simple. Now that the concept of the heroic has been modified, who's the hero of the Rama story? Of course, it remains Rama. But is Rama still the human himself, or is he now Vishnu? Some of the more highly developed later adaptations call him exclusively Vishnu, and clearly think of him as Vishnu the god, not as Rama the man or former man. But Agastya tells us that whoever he is, he's not necessarily as great as we were led to believe when he was a single human being ranged um, against an all-powerful enemy. Even allowing for the fact that space is limited in such a brief summary of the whole complex narrative, the redirected focus has removed the need for any mention of some of the tradition's most significant and most prominent characters. Sita herself appears only as a hint, rebirth as a heroine whose abduction leads to the death of Ravana, will enable one of his victims to achieve revenge. Rama's father, preservation of whose integrity was the issue that set the whole Rama narrative in motion, has no place at all in Agastya's plot. The identity of Rama himself is even more complex, and a radical anomaly is immediately created when the narrative of Vishnu's incarnation is inserted into Rama's birth story in Book One, which is similarly an addition to the core text, that part evidently slightly earlier than Agastya's narrative. It's already part of the story that Rama is one of four sons. The question of whether Vishnu is incarnate only as Rama or as all four is a conundrum that bedevils all subsequent versions. Hundreds of later tellers have struggled in vain to find a satisfactory resolution. The most usual ploy is to declare Vishnu to have undertaken a fourfold incarnation and then to ignore its implications for the narrative. All Vishnus are born equal, but one Vishnu is more equal than the other three. Agastya avoids the problem completely. He has only one Vishnu. The unifying thread linking all subsections and their subsections of Agastya's post-victory narratives is the attempt to force the well-known, highly popular and carefully crafted Rama narrative 
into a new mould to make it conform to different standards and values. Subunit 1 revises the tradition by adding new material that prevent, presents a Ravana at much the same stage of development as the human hero. Since Rama doesn't actually appear in person, either as Rama or Vishnu in this part of the text, our view of him is revised only by inference. Subunit 2, where the hero is unequivocally acknowledged to have become Vishnu, is more than a mere revision. It has been adapted to conform to profound contemporary societal changes and demonstrate a complete revisioning of the nature and purpose of the narrative and its most prominent characters. Beginning with the triumph of the incarnate Vishnu over Ram Ravana's ancestors, an omen for the future, it goes on to explore some drawbacks of an incarnation that can operate only within the limited constraints of the traditional narrative. A backstory has been created for Ravana, but not only are the gods rendered powerless by his boon, Vishnu himself is impotent to intervene earlier than the traditional plot line allows. The intended revision has been hamstrung. An even more dramatic development, possibly the latest contribution to the growth of the Valmiki Ramayana critical edition text, appears in an apparent coda to Agastya's tale where the tone has evolved from the traditionally heroic to tasteless ridicule and vulgar burlesque, presenting a subversive revisionist image of heroes, gods and villain alike. With the intervention of a god into the original simple story of good versus evil, celebrating the triumph of man over the supernatural, evil has now been shown to be no longer a serious threat. This distortion never overcame the prevalent rever reverence for the hero, whether he's called Rama, Vishnu, or later still, the god Ram himself. But an undercurrent of opposition to the image of the all-too-perfect hero can be detected in many later versions. That such disparate elements could be tolerated in a single episode is evidence that the culture that produced it was now in a state of transition. A tribute to the quality and enduring attraction of the original narrative that has enabled it to survive that process with its popularity unimpaired. Thank you. <laughs>